Hello, it's Scott Manley here. As you've probably heard by now, SpaceX performed the third test flight of Starship and Super Heavy on Pi Day, March 14th. Why do people love Pi? I don't know. It's irrational. It's also transcendental, and it's also SpaceX's 22nd birthday. The launch window was supposed to open at 7am, but this was delayed, uh, as many of us feared, including myself, due to the weather. There was a, there were some serious concerns with the winds, with the, the speeds predicted to reach 37 knots at 3,000 feet. SpaceX's goal was to be more successful than they were on flight number two, where but they successfully hot staged, but the booster exploded and the Starship failed to reach orbit after an oxygen dump caused a fire in the engine bay and ultimately a vehicle failure. So the first thing we were watching out for was the hot staging to make sure that the engines on the booster relit successfully after they didn't do it on IFT2. And then we'd be watching the boost back and the descent through the atmosphere, hopefully to a soft landing. Meanwhile, Starship was going to continue downrange, following a slightly different trajectory into a lower inclination orbit, which would carry it over Africa and then into a landing in the Indian Ocean. During this partial orbit, it would perform a number of other tests. It would open the PEZ dispenser cargo door. It would perform a cryogenic propellant transfer test between tanks inside. And it would attempt to relight the engine. And that would actually mean that the place that it touched down in the Indian Ocean wouldn't be certain because they would have to perform this maneuver. And finally, we all hoped it would get to the re-entry phase, where we'd actually finally get to see the heat shield, the belly flop maneuver at Mach 25. And so I can tell you now that SpaceX absolutely achieved more successes than on its previous flights. Definitely a step forward, albeit they didn't get all the successes that they wanted. Right away, straight after liftoff, the first thing we did was we looked at that engine diagram and we saw all engines lit. And... Saw this drone footage, again, showing this flying wonderfully through these clouds. Now, unfortunately, that meant a lot of the fans who are over in Boca Chica did not get a great view of this. There was fog right up till launch, and uh, yeah, that was a problem. But we did get a lot of onboard footage. The onboard footage from this flight was absolutely your know, chef kiss. Oh, perfect. We got so many great views. And a big part of this was just having multiply redundant Starlink uh, antenna on the side of both the Starship and the booster. I particularly love this moment where it ascends through a cloud layer. Just it, It's great seeing these stratified clouds just whipping by you in a rocket. I wish my plane climbed that fast. Then again, I'm glad I'm not footing this fuel bill. At around that time, by the way, it would have been passing through max Q, maximum aerodynamic pressure. From the Starship's point of view, we do see a few tiles missing, but it seemed like uh, an improvement again on previous flights. I think this is my favourite camera, by the way, because it sticks out on one of the fins, so it stands a reasonable distance away from the edge of the rocket. You can actually see the surface. So anyway, at this point, it's getting up high. We're going to play this at four times regular speed. It's we're, we're not worried about any structural failures at this point. It is just ascending, getting faster. What we're really concerned about is when stage separation happens. So yeah, the plan is here. You have to shut down a bunch of engines, but not all of the engines. And then once you're stable, you have to light the engines on the second stage and have them fly apart. And once they are sufficiently far apart, you relight the engines on the first stage as it heads back to home. This time, they got all those engines lit on the first stage. If you remember, during the previous flight, the engines were failing. We saw all sorts of puffs of smoke as engines started to die, and eventually the booster exploded. Now, this was officially blamed on stuff that was clogging propellant filters. Uh, I, we don't know what that stuff was. It could well be bits of the inside of the tank from fuel slosh, but until SpaceX uh, tells us otherwise, we don't know. In this case, however, it is boosting backwards, reducing the velocity while the altitude increases, and eventually it will be going backwards towards home. Not quite all the way home, just far enough that they can show that this boost back works. Now, then the thing to watch for is the shutdown of the engines, and it seems rather asymmetrical to me. I'm not sure if that's bad telemetry, but if it isn't, that asymmetric shutdown would seem to imply there was some problem. It's not clear what. So anyway, Starship continues downrange, but for the booster, 
Its trajectory is very similar to what we see for the Falcon 9 booster, so we would largely consider that to be a solved problem. One big difference is that the booster uh, does not use an entry burn. It's going to hit the atmosphere at full speed and take all that force because it's designed to do this from day one. The primary control mechanism during this phase will be the four large grid fins. And you can see one of them uh, on the left screen, that is the booster, and you can see the grid fin. So we're going to return to normal speed now, we're below 50 kilometers, descending at one kilometer per second, and still picking up speed here. You can see the grid fins begin to try to control, but very quickly, it looks to me as if the control sort of begins, begins to get unstable. And, you know, truthfully, I think what they're probably doing is exploring the performance of these fins, or these grid fins, because this is a regime that they've never actually tested in, so they'll be actuating it, recording details, and their control laws, right, the logic may not be correct. But anyway, look, we're at 30,000 feet, and we're descending still at multiple times the speed of sound. Just watch those cloud layers flip by, but very quickly... The booster seems to pick up some kind of roll oscillation. Also, check the condensation clouds down around the bottom. It's trying to relight the engines. They don't all come up, and we just lose contact with it at zero altitude. So look, clearly the engines didn't start. There's a couple of possibilities. One is that when they shut them down, there was a problem, and that's what we saw during the, the telemetry showing the, the sort of weird asymmetric touchdown. It's also possible that the motions of the vehicle just, again, caused fuel slosh, caused something to get you know become a problem, and they just couldn't relight those engines because the propellant was sitting in the wrong place. But you know what was in the right place? It was Starship, which uh, about eight minutes later successfully made it to orbit, becoming... I believe the largest spacecraft ever launched it into orbit. Now, technically, okay, it's not exactly in orbit. It was slightly suborbital, but it had so close to orbital energy that anybody that tries to split those hairs is just, you know, some weird SpaceX hater. SpaceX deliberately chose for this flight to not quite go to orbit for safety reasons, and uh, you could easily have got there. And yeah, we, yeah, we then had a uh, you know, good 40 minutes of beautiful footage from this. It, it would come and go over time, but uh, yeah, some of the footage from this was absolutely breathtaking. The footage would come and go as you know the live links were established and dropped. And there was probably a lot of complicated stuff going on. But yeah, the spacecraft uh, initially it seemed to you know, hold this attitude. And we saw a lot of outgassing, and that would be consistent with dumping the excess propellant. Remember, they had done this on a previous flight, and it had caused a failure, so dumping it after they got to orbit would make some sense. But one of the most interesting bits of footage uh, from the orbit came, it was just a clip very early on before they tested the door. It was our first camera view inside the nose cone of Starship. And what I see here is clouds as if there's an atmosphere still in there, right? It's not like if it was in a vacuum. And I think that while this isn't designed to be airtight, it was sufficiently pressure tight that there was still some pressure in here when they were ready to open the door. And so remember, this is like a little, like a letter box that opens up. And you see when they open that, do you see what I'm seeing here, right? When that thing slid up just a little, we had the atmosphere just blow out through that. What's also interesting is because that is a very thin sliver with light coming through it, you get one of those sort of laser light smoke machine kind of effects. And it looked a bit like water when I first saw, or a liquid. And I thought this must have been inside the propellant tanks. But no, it's an optical illusion. What I'm also seeing, though, is that door doesn't look like it fully opened. I mean, it's really hard to tell because of the, the camera angle. But we saw this happen later in the flight as they were supposed to be closing it. I think the door failed, and it could be that there was just too much atmosphere held inside the vehicle when they tried to open it, and that caused some problems. You know, the space shuttle early flights, they actually had problems with the payload bay doors too, so it's not unprecedented. So anyway, moving onwards, the next test that was supposed to happen was the cryogenic propellant transfer, and... Well, we heard it announced, we heard them mention it, we saw confirmation, but honestly there wasn't any clues as to how successful this w was, whether it worked or not, and whether the rolling of the spacecraft was part of this process. This is something that happened as it began to roll around its axis. 
And that could absolutely be intentional. We don't know what their planned attitude was, but um, obviously the Apollo's program, they used that for thermal control. Space Shuttle didn't do that on the other hand. The final on-orbit test was supposed to be relighting the engine, and that was going to be performed autonomously if the conditions were correct. And when the time rolled by, we didn't have any video, we didn't have any uh, telemetry that suggested it happened, and SpaceX said, yep, it didn't happen. They're not telling us why the engines didn't light, but say that attitude, the, the rotation, the spinning, was uh, somehow anomalous, that could have interfered with an engine relight. So now fast forward a couple of minutes and they're getting ready for entry and the thing is still rotating. It's not really got rid of the roll around its primary axis. And I think, and so whether that roll was part of the flight plan or not, I'm pretty sure it shouldn't be rolling at this portion of the flight plan because it's supposed to be getting into its you know, uh, belly flop attitude for entering the atmosphere. And if it's rotating around its axis like this, it's not controlling that. As much as it's great that it's giving us these amazing images, uh, I, I think they'd much rather have the vehicle in the correct attitude. We were really eager to see whether the heat shield would perform, especially given that we saw a couple of tiles missing, but the majority of tiles were still there. However, I don't think we got to see a proper heat shield test because I think the vehicle didn't maintain attitude control correctly. Indeed, we get to a point where um, we start to see debris getting blown off the top of the vehicle. And I'm wondering, is that coming out from underneath the heat shield? Has it been trapped there? Is this perhaps uh, stuff getting blown off by attitude control jets? Like, why didn't this come off during the initial ascent is my question. Because we start to see fairly substantial chunks of stuff coming off. If you remember, this uh, camera is sticking out on the end of a fin. It's actually quite a long way from the vehicle. So you don't get that effect of really tiny debris looking bigger than it should actually be. At this altitude of 100 kilometers or so, we should start to see the effects of atmosphere pulling away light things like, say, broken tiles, for, for example. You'll also notice the fin is working, left fin, just like left shark doesn't know its dance moves. Uh, this spacecraft is upside down. It's not presenting the heat shield, right? It's the non-heat shield side is currently facing the, the airflow. And so I watched this and it's coming around with the heat shield side down. I was like, hope it can stop that spin, right? Because it's now in roughly the correct at attitude for entry. If it can just hold this, it can make it through. But unfortunately, it was not to be. You see, yeah, we get a moment where those fins appear to be working, but the roll is continuing. It's high enough up that it's just not getting any control authority from those uh, winglets. It really needs the reaction control thrusters to be doing something, but we're not seeing it. We saw so much gas getting dumped earlier in the flight, but it's not happening now. Has it run out? Is it, you know, they talked about using ullage gas. Do they need to upgrade the reaction control thrusters? Yeah, again, this is now heading upside down. We actually see like a puff of something there. Was that a reaction control thruster firing? Again, now, uh, yeah, looking backwards along its trail, it's upside down and it's headed into the atmosphere. And I think I can begin to see a small hint of, of a glow here, right? We're starting to hit the plasma you know, portion of this flight. At Mach 25, the atmosphere is slamming into this vehicle and it is compressing and the compression is heating up the air to the point that it turns into a plasma. The electrons are disassociated from the nuclei and uh, that will start to get in the way of communications. And so that's why we've never really seen re-entry footage like this live. Think about it, this is something we've never seen coming live from a spacecraft. We expect at some point that the communications would drop because that plasma is getting in the way of communications and Starship would somehow have to send a signal back through it. Now, you'll notice, by the way, that the roll seems to have reversed, but now it appears to be pitching with its ass pointed downrange. And so instead of that hot plasma impinging on the heat shield, it's going to start going into the engine bay, into various, you know, sensitive parts of the vehicle. 
That's why you have to maintain attitude control. We didn't know how long we would get live footage from this. We were getting telemetry via the TDRIS system and we were getting footage via Starlink. And you'll, you'll notice, by the way, that the speed is really still not decreasing. It's actually still increasing. Even although you've got all this violent heating going on, the air density is still really low. It's not enough to actually slow the vehicle down. So it just has to endure this kind of heating that is obviously um, doing a number on the spacecraft. There was a real hope that we might actually get live footage all the way down because Starship is big enough that it actually punches a hole through the atmosphere wide enough that you can send a radio signal back through that hole. And so it is possible that we could get this perhaps in a future flight, but not on this one. There are essentially two ways where you have a communications blackout due to plasma. The first is that, yeah, plasma gets hot, electrons flowing around, they're conductive, they interfere with radio waves and the signal can't get out. The other is where your communications equipment gets hit by the atmosphere and turns into a plasma and can no longer communicate. And that is an altogether more permanent kind of plasma blackout. And it's the kind that Starship experienced on its first full re-entry. The last signals we got suggested that it had lost uh, 1,000 kilometers per hour of its 27,000 kilometers per hour that it needed to lose. So again, an objectively successful flight, setting new records for space flight. The US now has a launch vehicle that could easily put hundreds of tons into orbit if they don't mind expending it. I mean, SpaceX apparently has quite a few boosters to spare. On the other hand, some basic things apparently didn't work. That door didn't look right. Uh, the attitude control failed and didn't get through re-entry, so we never really got to know how good that heat shield is. I'm looking forward to flight four, but I actually want to rewind to the stage separation because I predicted that they would make changes to the timing, and I want to look at this in detail again. So I've synchronized IFT3 at the top, IFT2 down below, and you'll watch the ignition and the shutdown of the engines sequence. Now, the timing of this is slightly different. The new telemetry doesn't show the big change in the velocity of the spacecraft. So is that just something that was actually just an artifact or have they changed the staging sequence? Because the timing is the same. The only thing I think they could have changed is perhaps the throttle on the booster. Instead of going to 50%, they might go higher. You'll also notice that on IFT3, the uh, staging happened about three seconds later. So they get a bit more oomph out of that booster this time. And yeah, taking a look at the final descent into the ocean, I'm pretty sure it's supposed to use the three center engines here and then somehow decides to use some engines from the outer ring. That probably indicates that something failed, especially since one of them shut down. So, you know, the booster at this point is just, oh, yeah, I'm going into the Gulf really fast. I hope there are some other photographs or imagery. There were a bunch of planes out there, including Jared Isaacman, I think, flying around in, an, in a jet to get some cool footage. I don't know if we'll get to see that, but it would be pretty cool if we did. And so now let's look forward to fourth flight. We're told that there could be as many as six flights this year, uh, and that would mean that we'd want the next flight within a couple of months. The previous flight was three months, Dropping it down to two months would make sense, and hopefully getting a bit closer to an actual successful, an unequivocal successful flight. And then, of course, they have to then figure out how to catch the boosters, how to refuel in space, how to land it. There's still a whole lot of things for SpaceX to learn about Starship through these awesome and spectacular test flights. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.